We're going live. I think it's working. Woo! We're live. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Awesome, awesome. Happy National Arts and Education Week. Woo! My name is Kwanis Floyd. I'm the Executive Director of Arts Education in Maryland Schools. Uh, my co-host today is Alicia Lee from the Maryland State Department of Education's Fine Arts Office. Woo -woo. So happy to be here with you, Kwanis. Awesome. And if you Celebrate don't know, art. if you don't know, now you know, we're celebrating Arts and Education Week, National Arts and Education Week. Um, and so AIMS is celebration of National Arts and Education Week is especially special for us because we are celebrating our arts educators from all around the state of Maryland. Give it up for the arts educators around the state. Woo -woo! Thank you, teachers. So if you don't know what Arts Education Week is, it's passed by Congress in 2010 as a part of the House Resolution 275, which designates the week beginning with the second Sunday in September as National Arts and Education Week. During the week, the field of arts education joins together in communities across the country to tell the story of the impact of the transformative power of arts and education. This year, Ains is celebrating our educators. And we're going to continue to celebrate our educators, not just this year, but every day, every year. We love our teachers here. Um, follow along with us this week as we interview arts educators from all around the state. So with us, we have Amy Beg Marino, who is a media arts educator. Thank you for joining us, Amy. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And so... Our initial question that we've been asking teachers is if you could uh, choose a, one sentence to describe what you do, what is what would that sentence be? Um, ooh. One sentence, I'm thinking it would be, I want to empower students and also inspire the next generation. Um, so yeah, like whether it's through teaching or through my personal art, that's definitely empower and inspire is is what I look for in what I do. That's awesome. Empower and inspire. And what grade students do you work with? And will you tell us where you are? Yeah, for sure. Um, I teach at Wiley H. Bates Middle School in Annapolis. Uh, it's in Anne Arundel County. And it's my fifth year teaching there. Uh, it's my almost 15th year teaching, but fifth year there. I love it. Um, it, and by choice, I'm in middle school. I am not there by default. I like those six, seventh, and eighth graders. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's that's my favorite group too. Middle school is, I think, the best group of students because they're still so easily curious. Yes. They're, right? They're so creative. And they're old enough that you can still make jokes with them like you do with high school kids. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. I think my running joke at parties is um, they're old enough to get my sarcasm, but they're not old enough to spit it back at me yet. Um, so yeah, I like it. They can understand me, but they're still so sweet. Like they haven't become jaded yet. So. <laughs> right, right. Like, the, yes, these millennial high school students. <laughs> it's hard to win those over. I had taught after school high school classes last year, and I was like, geez, you guys are a tough crowd. Yes, yeah. yes. There's definitely teachers match with certain certain age groups. Will you tell us, Amy, so how, why did you become an arts educator? We know, we know why you're working with middle school kids, because it fits you. It's your bag. And how did, where did, you know, what was your trail to arts educator? Okay, so it was a long and windy trail to get me to teaching. <laughs> I uh, went to college originally just to become an artist. Um, my bachelor's is in fine arts, uh, double major art history and photography, um, because I wanted to be like the next documentary photographer that like travels the globe. Um, and I did that for a little while and then realized I really would also like a steady paycheck um, so I then went into like working in corporate and doing arts and working in media and doing a lot of digital design. And so that's where I was like, oh, hey, I can pick all this stuff up. My father's a computer programmer, like everything comes really easy to me that way. Um, and then uh, throughout the years, like working jobs, different jobs, uh, I realized the thing that I like the most is when I got to teach something to someone else. Uh, so 
you know, I had a momentary epiphany in my late 20s and uh, went to the Baltimore City Teacher Residency, got trained for like a whopping month and then thrown in city classrooms um, to learn if I could hack it in a K through eight school. So um, it, it seems it was trial by fire, but it was a good fire. Um, so <laughs> yeah, and then Anne Arundel County wooed me away with their PBA program and performing and visual arts. So. Wonderful. Well, you know, fire refines and cleans. So sometimes fire works. Will you tell us about the PVA program? You said that they, they wooed you with it. So what's special about PVA? Um, so PVA program, so it starts in middle school and runs through high school. Um, it's for all of the arts. So it's everything from instrument, instrumental music, vocal music, dance, creative writing, drama, and then the fine arts of uh, visual arts. So when I was interviewing at different counties, uh, because I was moving away from the city, so I was like, ah, oh, you know, I got to go to the county. Um, when I went there, the amount of support they give kids um, is just amazing to me in Anne Arundel County. Like, I have a classroom of desktop computers, 25 of them for my kids, and they all run Adobe programs that I can teach. I teach sixth graders how to use Photoshop, Illustrator, and Adobe Animate. Like, that's crazy to me, especially because I taught for like 10 years in the city where getting a working computer for me was epically hard. Um, so, like, and on top of that, they do um, auditions, but the auditions are so um, I guess, open to interpretation that people, even if you haven't come up with like formal education in the arts or your parents haven't sent you to art classes, there's still room for you to be admitted to this magnet program so that you can learn with some of the best teachers I've had the privilege to work with. Um, and they're just, they're exceptional in their talent. They're exceptional in how they teach. They love teaching kids. And then on top of that, they're working artists which is even cooler, um, I think, to show that you teach because you love it, not because of any other reason, you know, like you're still, so that's how they got me. Um, they, uh, they have just a really wonderful, like, program motto in, like, the joy of teaching and bringing the arts to them in all ways. That's incredible. Now, we've got lots of folks tuning in because, you know, we're, the three of us are so engaging. Ah! <laughs> so what the people want to know is, you know, media arts is a newer art form, right? Mm -hmm. By its name, we know it's newer because it's deep. There's a technology word in there, right? So what can you tell us about media arts for someone who's never heard of media arts? What is it? Okay. So I don't know about other counties, but Anne Arundel is awesome with providing um, access to the entire Adobe Suite, which is like 20 some programs. Um, so they learn digital photo manipulation from me. Uh, they learn how to collage. They learn how to do website design, animation, um, graphic design, um, everything to do with photography because you know I love photography, it's my bachelor's. Um, and then let's see, what else do we do? Uh, yeah, that's a lot of it. Digital painting. Um, I'm doing a self-portraiture unit with my eighth graders right now, and they're doing self-portraits digitally. So that's everything from doing very like collaged pieces that integrate multiple different forms of media, whether that's video, animation, photography, all that, or it's um, like a very traditional painting style, but done with like a drawing tablet. You know, and so we have drawing tablets for our students. A lot of them have ended up buying them at home because they just love doing digital drawing so much more. Uh, it's crazy how quickly kids pick it up. But uh, yeah, so it's all of the art that you see. I teach product design, advertising, like I kind of touch on it all so that by the time they get to high school, if they want to stay in the PBA program, they know what track kind of that they want to go on. That's awesome. So that combination of technology, design, visual art for for instance in your case you're teaching more of a visual art based um is all combining that sounds like a great thing because kids love to be able to work interdisciplinary so um what a great oh, yeah. field of study will you talk to us about your so yesterday in our session we we, we mentioned this is a family parable of mine that every teacher is a teacher because of another teacher. This doesn't mean it's true, but so, right, that because of another teacher. Either you had an amazing teacher who just made you feel on top of the world, 
or you had a teacher that you vowed, you vowed, right? Because they were so awful. You vowed that one day, <laughs> middle school you said, one day I'll be the teacher and I'll do this the right way. So what about you? What, who was your, you know, who were you inspired by to become a teacher? Who inspires your, your teaching habits and, 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 and what you do in the classroom? Okay, so I was pretty lucky. I had awesome teachers, especially my K through eight school. Um, but the one that stands out, and I think maybe this is why I have such a love for middle school. It's a middle school. Uh, he was my middle school English teacher. Um, like six, seven, and eighth, I because I went to a small school. Um, had the same English teacher all three years. And Mr. Wittig, he's now the principal of my own school. Um, props out to him. Um, he just created such a wonderful environment in the classroom. So like he was our English teacher and a third of the class was like individual desks, a third of it was like round tables. And then a third was like a couch, a beanbag, a rug. And this was in like the late eighties. So this was not a thing that was done yet, um, by the way. And uh, like, so sometimes we would be writing individually. Sometimes we would be having class discussions. And then sometimes like we would have free write time and he would put on like Tracy Chapman, which I love because I grew up like having these great experiences and she's awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, like, and I could sit on the windowsill if I wanted to write that day. I could sit on the floor if I wanted to write. And for me, like, it was just so nice and free and it was such a comfortable space to create in. And I think that when I became a teacher, that's exactly the same feeling I wanted for my kids. So like when you come into my classroom, I am always playing music. I have some like some cool song on or something that you wouldn't expect. Like one day I might be playing, you know, AJR and then the next day I might be playing Tracy Chapman and then the next day I might be playing Credence, you know? And then so like they get all of this music, they can request it. It's a social atmosphere in my class. Like, don't get me wrong, when you need to listen, you need to and listen but like because I expect that then when you are creating it's so much more of a comfortable space um to be in and that was what he gave to me and on top of that super creative man like awesome projects and like so I I wrote him actually as a teacher when I was oh I don't know four years in teaching in the city and I was like oh my god I have so much more respect for you now like, uh, I had no idea this is what it took. Oh my God, it's exhausting to inspire children. Um, and he was like, and I was like, oh, and by the way, I don't know if you remember me. Um, and he was like, of course I remember you. You sat on my windowsills. And I was like, oh, yeah. So I had a moment. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So nice. awesome. Quanice, Quanice and I visit hundreds of schools a year. So we're going to, we need to come out and visit Wiley together and come and see your students and, and see you guys in action. For sure. And you'll know when you get to my room, it's painted in like three um, shades of blue on stripes on the wall. But like you can't miss my room. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. And so it was great to hear about your, your teacher who inspired you, your English teacher. And so what keeps you motivated? Because it, it seems like a lot of those characteristics that your English teacher had, it, it, it feels like it's kind of, you know, embedded in you and who you are and it's how you want to portray yourself to your students. So what keeps you motivated to teach? Um, so I would say like, and I get asked this a lot, like when I get introduced at parties or something and I'll be out with other adults and they're like, oh my God, how do you stay motivated? You seem so positive. And I was like, oh, I'm like 85% solid positive. And then the other 15% is just like, all right, go to work. Like, just do it. Um, but to stay positive, Honestly, every time my kids come in my classroom, there's some child that comes in and is like, oh my God, I saw this artist or Miss um, Beg, hey, I listened to that band you were playing or, uh, I mean, like it's just some random middle school comment and it just makes me so happy to be there. Um, you know, that aside, I, you know, kids that'll come back and find me years later to tell me that like they're still doing art or they've gone to school to become a, a, a teacher because, you know, like those things are like, oh, those are like hard strengths, but that doesn't keep you on a daily basis. A daily basis, I just love seeing my kids and seeing that they like, they start to really have a sense of pride in their work. Cause there's, I teach the PBA program, but I also teach like the regular Encore kids and who some of them have never had art or I only had art like two, three years ago for like a quarter, 
you know? Um, and so when they get to me, they're like, I don't know where to go on a computer. I don't know how to do this. I'm not really good at drawing. And then by the end of the semester, they're animating something and they're like, oh my God, did you see what I put on my YouTube channel? Because I had an animation. Um, and so like, it's so great. I, you can't, you can't buy that anywhere else. And I've worked a lot of different jobs in a lot of different arenas. And I don't feel that same joy. Uh, I have to work for it, but like, it's, it's serious joy from seeing that. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. <laughs> Joy, I mean, I, me and Alicia just like shaking our heads because we felt that. Uh, so speaking of joy, uh, how have you handled uh, teaching during these times, during the pandemic? And uh, what were some of your biggest challenges and how did you overcome them? And I feel like Joy would probably be part of that answer. <laughs> um, yeah. So like, I think I figured it out midway through, like we were out in March. Um, and then like by April, I kind of had to figure it out that I needed to do everything a little bit bigger than I do any other time. Um, and I'm Italian, so like bigger, we can go big um, with our hand gestures. But like the more that, <laughs> so big. Um, but like the more you are you and you're not like, and so today class, are going to do you know like the more they can feel it and even if you're a little bit of a dork about it they're so much more comfortable about talking to you about turning on your camera like earlier today I had to stop class to turn around and take a screw that my dog had found um because I'm renovating my house and he was like hey I'm gonna eat this screw and I was like no and they're like oh and the whole class you could see everybody like dying in silent laughter um and that's what makes it fun like you gotta like embrace the the stuff that comes your way like the lawnmower that blows by when you are trying to give a speech in class you know or something like that so I think that the way I got through it was just to have a whole lot of patience and then tell kids that you need to find some way of a workaround. So like, if you don't have access to this, figure it out, like figure out a different way, change your plan, do something new, because honestly, and that's a really cool skill to teach them because there are so many times I've been at work and I'm like, oh, okay, I don't have this. Let's see what I can do with this. Like the projector is not working. Okay, we're gonna like hold up my slides over here. Um, so the more they learned that and the more they like realized any avenue they took as long as it was like a chosen one that they had a better time doing the projects so yeah that's how i handled last semester this semester i'm not sure because we're a little more hardcore about what we need but mm. uh, yeah will you describe for us i mean that's the other thing people want to know uh, is what is it like teaching online what is it like doing remote learning and um, you know, what are you seeing? What are some of those those high moments? Have you had any any things that have happened that you're like, yeah, this is pretty great? Um, so I kind of have the privilege of so the PVA program, you stay with us for three years in middle school. So like my eighth graders that I'm currently teaching this semester, I've had for two other years. So they already know me. So like, I don't have to do all those icebreaker games. I just get to be like, oh, my God, yay. And then we can get to work. Um, and so for that classroom, because they know how I am and how I kind of want to move and like transitions are very quick with me. Um, they came into my class today. Um, there was music playing. There's a slide that I have up that says we're starting at this time. Be prepared. Have your sketchbook. Have something to draw with. Have your camera. Because when I tell you to sketch something, I then immediately want you to take a picture of it and throw it into Google Classroom on your phone because we're all addicted to our phones, even children. <laughs> so they're quite adept at it. And once you teach them once, it's up there in 25 seconds once they're done. So it's really cool to teach them and do that legwork and then you get to see the product. So today they came in, we drew eyes. Um, everybody had to take a quick up close picture of their eye. I told them to exaggerate it in some way. And we did um, all did a picture of our eyes. We all sat and drew for 10 minutes, music was on. I could answer some questions during that time too, which was really cool because they had an assignment due and a couple of people had technical difficulties with it. So that gives me some breathing room as I'm drawing. Uh, it's a great way to start the class. It puts them in a good mood. And then um, we did a lecture on self-portraiture and what it means and how many different ways you can do it and do I have to show my face? And oh my God, Miss Beg, I don't wanna do my face. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, and so I showed them a whole bunch of artistic exemplars. We talked about it. 
And then um, we started doing sketches and concept statements and things like that. Um, so that was today's 45 minute block. Um, by the next class, they have to have their sketch done so we can have like feedback on it. And so like, I wanna do different things and transitions during class, um, but that requires you like learning a skill. So like that is my eighth graders who already have some skills. My sixth graders that I got this semester that have never touched a computer before and never heard me before. The first class was, we're going to breathe <laughs> and we're going to take Adobe very slowly. And this is how you log on to a virtual desktop because there are adults that um, have problems logging into virtual interfaces. And these kids have to log on to a remote desktop connect to it, multiple sign-ons, multiple logins, log into Adobe inside that, realize the concept of a virtual desktop, which is a desktop inside of your computer. Like, that's crazy to ask a sixth grader, an 11 year old to gasp that, and then, you know, do that in a 40 minute block. <laughs> so um, that's a lot of breathing in the sixth grade and a lot of me, you know, waiting and asking them icebreaker questions and things like that right now. So. I love that. Yes. You know, I mean, always teachers are building relationships that they can use to leverage to, to get students to take risks and to be creative and to be vulnerable and to try new things. Right. Because learning is a vulnerable thing. We forget that as adults because um, we know everything already. That's why. <laughs> but it sounds like it sounds like in online learning, that is a must. You know, there really is. There has to be that relationship. Um, so that kids can um, take those risks because they have a there's a big learning curve of what they need to learn just to be able to access space and school space. Yeah, and I think that I more so than anything want them to be empowered to speak up and ask a question and be an advocate for themselves mm -hmm. because sometimes that digital barrier is so hard for them to like break through. Like they'll they'll be like I'm confused or you can see them being confused. Like the look is like. Ah. You know, and you're like, sweetie, what's wrong? Like unmute, talk to me, tell me what's wrong. And they're like, well, I missed that last step. And I was like, oh, okay, tell me the last step. And they're like, it was like eight steps ago, Miss Bag. And I'm like, it's okay, sweetie, it's all right. We're gonna do it. I'm gonna get them going and you just pause for a minute. And you see them like sit there and like kind of, okay, no problem. And the more you do that, I think the more comfortable they feel in this environment um because this is totally different than what they've been groomed to be like yes. raise a hand ask a question you know kind of thing yes absolutely it sounds like your students really know you've got their back hopefully because <laughs> yeah, i'm gonna ask them to do a whole bunch of stuff so like hopefully they know i have my ba their back so. all right awesome and so the this is a journey right um especially during this time of you know, multiple pandemics and, and cultural and socio issues that are happening within the country. Um, and so as you think forward or as you, you know, continue to go on your journey, what are some things that you think you might need support from when it comes to, you know, parents or admin or central office? Oh, that's interesting. So I think that what I'd want from like central office is the ability to reevaluate um, multiple times during the year. Meaning like if this program or this interface is not working for us and we need something new, okay, then let's quickly get on that and let's try to find a better way to reach out to students to do this or you know whatever it needs to be. So that's what I'd like from the central office because that's not like teachers and admin, we don't have the time to do that and constantly investigate programs and different modalities and things like that. Um, from my admin, hmm, uh, to have my back as long as I'm in the right. Um, <laughs> so it, as long as I'm in the right, I really just need you to back me up. Um, but uh, also to be really efficient in these times, like everybody is working longer hours right now in education because we're having to like revamp curriculum. We're having to like do recordings of our lessons in order to help out kids that missed it or didn't have Wi-Fi connect. So it's like really creating three lessons for one lesson. Um, and to just make everything go a little bit more efficiently. So like 
And our principal is really awesome. Miss Hicks is so cool. She starts the meeting on time and ends the meeting on time. And I so love her for that. Um, and like she had professional development our first week of school where she had the document with the hyperlinks that you could just click in it. And I was like, girl, I love you. Um, really, I did. Because that was so much simpler than having to like go back here and find this email and this invite. And so streamline from my admin is really what I want. And coworkers are just there to, you know, listen to me as a sounding board and then help me up if I need to get up and be inspired. And it's been a rough day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, we've, we've also seen so many colleagues come together and collaborate. I mean, you know, just helping each other. You know, on Facebook, I see in teacher groups, a teacher posting something and another person coming by and say, how did you do that? And the person actually shares how they did it. Right? I mean, because, <laughs> you know, you can always Google. But people have been so collaborative about sharing um, the tools that they're learning and helping everybody to really get up to speed. And that has been really inspiring to see that kind of collaboration. Are you seeing that with your students, that kind of drive and um, maybe deeper excitement about collaboration? So I definitely think. Um... I see that helpful quality that I have to nurture a little bit more in class, like okay. to create a community because there's a chat room and it's less like walking over to a student and things like that. Like you, if I don't get to a question right away, two students that know how to do it, that I've already answered it are like, oh yeah, you hit here. Yes, hit the allow button. Like it's so cute. Um, and there was one child and, and I love tech savvy kids. I do. They're on the ball, um, but they are quick on that chat. And they're like, oh no, you need to do this. Oh, here's the shortcut for this. Do this. And there was a child the other day that was like, I appreciate the help, but could you just let Miss Beg answer? Um, and it was so cute um, because the child was working so hard to be like extra helpful. And he was like, okay, cool, man. I, I can do that. You know? <laughs> um, so there's that. Yeah. I mean, I think the kids are are really empathetic right now because everybody's going through something. Everybody's going through something, whether it's, I don't have the tech for it, or I had to move houses, or my mom's out of her job. Like there's something, everybody's got something right now. Um, so kids are just all about listening lately, I think to each other, yeah. That's very exciting. That's a positive. We're always looking for those silver linings. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, you you uh, gotta look for them. <laughs> yes, little blooms, um, little blooms in the space. Um, let's see. I wonder if we. I'm gonna throw it back to Quinnies. Great, awesome. So I do want to add, ask another question. Um, so we know that oftentimes when it comes to educational policies, um, they often do not reflect um, what's going on in the schools on a local level. Um, and it honestly can sometimes get in the way of being, you know, being able to support the students in the best way that you can. And so if you had any advice for lawmakers who are in those positions of creating educational policy, what advice would you give them? Ooh. Um, to make the education system a little bit more adaptable to wherever people are. Um, so when I was in the city, um, we were still doing No Child Left Behind and it didn't fit where I was. You know, my school was 98% free and reduced lunches. All kids were poverty, you know, like, and to be, to, to say that everybody needed to be on grade level and above grade level in order to, you know, have that school be okay for that year and standards and things like that was just ridiculous. You know, you had kids that came in that were two grade levels under it. And to just get on grade level by the end of the year was like, oh my God. So there was that. And then when I get to Anne Arundel County, you've got a mixed population everywhere, almost in our county. We're a very diverse county um, as far as like high income, low income, um, different races, different ethnicities. Um, and I think that education is sort of stuck in the, like lawmaking wise, is stuck in the past with like, oh, we have to have these things because we have to have these things. Um, and then the other half of it is, oh, but we want to innovate and we want to push kids and there's rigor and like, we're going to add all these extra things 
but we didn't get rid of the things that hinder us. Do you know what I mean? So they're sort of like dipping their toes on both sides of the line, um, but they haven't really committed to either way. And so there's a lot of hoops to jump through a lot of times, but those hoops like lead you down different paths, which I don't, I don't know if that makes any sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, what it sounds to me is that there's a, a lack of understanding around equity, honestly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, definitely for my school, for sure. Like, um, we have, you know, a third very low income population, a third um, English as second language um, kind of population, and then a third a little bit high income, you know, so you have kids that have multiple devices right now that have like huge digital chairs to sit in that have speakers in them. And then the next kid sitting next to them has like a laptop that we gave them and they're working in a room with no art on the walls, no tech, you know, like, and you can see the difference and it's, it's stark right now. Like you can very much see it. So um, I have to go handle a dog. Sorry about that. Yep, this was all. Okay. <laughs> I'm, seeing on, I'm seeing on Facebook, Jane Bloom is um, giving us some high fives and saying, hi, Amy. I think it looks like we have a mutual friend. And that makes me think too about not just our, um, uh, our legislators and our decision makers, but also the community. You know, our community and especially the arts community can be a really strong assistance, I think, in times like these, in terms of providing resources. Have you guys um, at, um, at Bates, have you guys collaborated with any artists um, since COVID started? Um, yeah, so different, yeah, we, having visiting artists right now is really awesome. And it's helping the artists out too. So like funds that we would normally buy paper with, which we can't give to the kids, we're having, I know, I would really love to give it to the kids. Um, but uh, yeah, so like we can't buy all the materials that we usually have bought. So having visiting artists come in, um, I am lucky I know a producer of documentary films, she's a pretty awesome producer in DC. So her two of the films she's making right now, the directors are gonna come talk to my students about how they got where they got, you know, this, that, and the other. She's gonna talk about production and what she looks for in artists. And so, like you just kind of have to go a different route. If you can't do one thing, like if I can't teach you as much filmmaking because I don't have the cameras to give to you to teach you filmmaking, how about I teach you the concept behind it and we storyboard it and maybe we do a comic instead and we do it that way where you can still tell your story. You now get the experience for in person, but you know, and then you get to meet this awesome experience of an artist that we couldn't have gone to see uh, because they're so busy. So. That's very cool. So that, that's also that benefit of because you are an artist and an arts educator, you have an arts network. And so you're able to wrap in the arts world for your students, which is really terrific. I think it's time for a shameless plug. The Maryland State Arts Council um, uh, has um, funding, arts and education funding to bring in teaching artists into spaces and they're still working virtually. So you can still apply for residency funding. Um, and if you have that extra paper money, you can make that 50% match, but you can also apply for a waiver from the match. If your school at the present moment doesn't have the funds to cover it um, due to COVID or other things. Um, so just, you know, Amy's given a big plug here for using our artists and using Maryland teaching artists, I think it'd be a really big benefit to a lot of, a lot of education programs. Um, yeah, and I always try to help out I try to stay local as much as possible. Um, but right now, because we are all stuck in our homes, I'm also trying to reach out to places that I could never have taken my students to. So like there's awesome indie animation houses and design houses that I've sent emails out to that are like, hey, do you mind popping in and showing us the new game or showing us your studio or something like that? And so I think hopefully if we can swing it, my students are gonna see a, um, a studio in London like in two weeks. So that's so dope. I cannot wait to show it to them and they're gonna be so stoked. Um, so yeah. That's absolutely great. I think, I love that, you know, I'm an improviser, I do improv theater. So I'm always gonna say both and, yes and. Yes, let, let's invest in our artists locally, but it, there's also an opportunity for us to receive visits, in-person visits, virtually, um, from artists all around the world and really to open up the arts world to our students. So how fantastic. 
That's awesome. Great. And so we have one final Ooh. question. Um, Unbelievable. So, this time has flown by, Kwani. It has. Indeed. It definitely has. So thinking about the next generation of arts educators and, and investing in them, and, and honestly, you are currently investing in potentially the next generation of arts educators in your classroom. Um, what advice would you, would you have for those students who are currently in undergraduate studies for media arts education programs and um, they're getting ready to, they're excited about student teaching and getting ready to go into whatever public school that they want to go into. What words of wisdom do you have to pass along to them? Um, ooh, embrace change. Um, like crazy change. Uh, I know that, and I can only see it from my perspective of 15 years in teaching, but like I have friends that have been teaching for like 30 years. And they're not loving the amount of change they've had to go through in the past like three years. Um, I'm a little more used to it because I, like, I just constantly had to keep changing things over the past like five, six years in arts. Um, but uh, I think it's only going to get like the speed of change and the rate of adaptability is going to get even higher for the next generation of educators. Like you're gonna have to be able to work digitally, classroom. You're gonna have to rule both of those realms like with ease. You're gonna have to be able to swing new tech on the fly. I think you're gonna have to be able to reach students in multiple ways of which sometimes it's a visual way, sometimes it's auditory, sometimes it's kinesthetic, sometimes it's fully virtual and tech because we just can't get there. Um, like I ah, embrace change. <laughs> like you're gonna do a lot of it, I think. Um, and then find something, find the reason, find and remember the reason you first wanted to be an educator. Like, because during that time from getting your education degree to getting into student teaching, to getting into your classroom, oh, those are some rough, rough years. <laughs> like you are lesson planning at night, you are figuring out classroom management, you are doing all of that and still trying to like, have your classroom in order during the day. So it's like two full-time jobs those first couple of years. So just really keep in mind why you chose to become a teacher because it gets better. It gets better um, is all I got to say. It gets better, right? Yes. The Trevor Project said it first and we're saying it here again. It gets better. That's a, a okay. great message for teachers and this idea of remaining flexible. Yeah, I hear that so strongly. That, these are life lessons, yeah. everyone. <laughs> these are lessons for life, which makes me think of the power of the arts, the power of arts education, right? We're learning lessons that, yes, can be applied directly in our arts discipline, but are literally life lessons that we can all take with us. Yes. Thank you so much, Amy. It's been really, 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 really amazing um, to have you here and to speak to you. Um, again, everyone, um, I'm Kwanis Floyd here with Alicia Lee, um, and we are celebrating National Arts and Education uh, Week. I'm saying month. One day we'll, we'll get there in March. We'll get there. <laughs> National Arts and Education Week, and we are celebrating Maryland arts educators. So Amy, we celebrate you. Thank you for oh, your commitment you. and your dedication to the students of Maryland. We love you. We love arts educators. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so everyone. much for having me. Yes. Can we plug tomorrow? People come back tomorrow. Yes, and so we're doing this every single day this week we are celebrating arts educators tomorrow we will have music educators oh. Thursday we will have uh theater educators oh. and then on friday we will have ver uh, visual arts educators and so uh, join us every day here facebook live ames's facebook live page 5 30 see you tomorrow happy national arts and ed week Woo! <laughs>